I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to our 2022 Hoyt Hoddle Lectureship. Before I introduce our distinguished lecturer, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the namesake for this lecture. Hoyt Hoddle actually came to MIT from Indiana in 1922 at the age of 19, having just gotten a Bachelor's of Arts in Chemistry uh, from Indiana University. He then got his Master's in Chemical Engineering and uh, ultimately became an assistant director of the Buffalo Practice School Station here at MIT before then becoming a faculty member in 1928, assistant professor of fuel and gas engineering and ultimately professor of fuel engineering. He remained active in the department throughout his life until his death in 1998 and he was a central figure at MIT uh, and particularly in the Department of Chemical Engineering for over 75 years. So this just gives you an idea of the set of problems that Hoyt Hoddle worked on. He'll be remembered for his intensity, intellect, and integrity. His lectures aim to make students think. He made seminal contributions to the measurement of gas emissivity. He established the mathematical framework for the quantitative treatment of furnaces, the first systematic investigation of the laminar, um, of the laminar flow behavior in furnaces, and uh, the laminar to turbulent transition in diffusion flames and explored heterogeneous combustion. He was also a co-founder with Bernard Lewis and A.J. Narod of the Combustion Institute. And he was ultimately elected to the National Academy of Science in 1963, the Ni National Academy of Engineering in 1974, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His professional awards are numerous, but they include the United States Medal of Merit, the Founders Award in NAE, the Founders Award in AICHE, and the William H. Walker Award, among many others. So Hoyt Hoddle had a huge interest in the future of energy, and his work is even relevant when we think about it today. Uh, here you can see one of the first solar energy houses, which he built in 1939. Um, and he actually um, had a great deal of interest in uh, sustainability and climate discussions. Uh, with funding from Godfrey L. Cabot in 1938, he organized the world's first solar energy utilization research center. And these studies led to the choice of the flat plate collector as the most promising device for solar heating and construction of these, this house and many others. So he actually had a huge imprint on the department because of his investigation in energy, in combustion, and uh, in that sense, modern day, uh, at that time, catalysis. I'm extremely excited to introduce our speaker today, Professor Donna Blackman of the uh, uh, Scripps Institute. Now, Donna Blackman was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which I think is a real coincidence because our previous Hoddle lecture was also from Pittsburgh, Francis Arnold. So we have a theme about Pittsburgh folks here. Um, she received her undergraduate and master's degree in chemical engineering uh, from Carnegie Mellon University in 1984. She became a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Pittsburgh shortly after graduating and was promoted to associate professor with tenure in 1989. Now Blackman remained in academia for eight years before moving on to the associate director position at Merck and Company Incorporated. Her main responsibility, responsibility at the company was to set up a laboratory for research and development in the kinetics and catalysis of organic reactions. She was a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute uh, for Kohlenforschung, I'm going to work on that, my German, uh, in Mohlheim, Anderur, Germany. She was professor and chair of physical chemistry at the University of Hull in Kingston, upon Hall in the UK, and professor of chemistry and chemical engineering and chair in catalysis at Imperial College London in the UK. Professor Blackman is now a professor of chemistry and the department chair and the John C. Martin Endowed Chair in Chemistry at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla. 
So here are a few different images that you'll find if you uh, look for Donna, and uh, including one from a really exciting interview that she gave in which we learned a lot of other things about uh, Donna. I invite you to uh, look that up and get a different perspective on things. Uh, she has been recognized internationally for her research, including awards from the British Royal Society, the German Max Planck Gesellschaft, and the American Chemical Society. She is an elected member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the German Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina. She has been a Woodward Visiting Scholar at Harvard, a Miller Institute Research Fellow at Berkeley, an NSF Visiting Professor at Princeton, uh, the, the Javadin Carrer Lecturer at University of Zurich, the Paul Gassman Lecturer at the University of Minnesota, and the Gordon Lecturer at the University of Toronto, among many others. We are extremely honored to have her here with us today. Uh, here we can see some images where she is representing some of the incredible minds at uh, UC San Diego Scripps Institute. And uh, we also see her meeting Tony Blair and describing some of her work to him, as well as one of the uh, uh, sort of uh, representations of the incredible works that she does. So we're going to hear a little bit more about that incredible work. I'm very excited to bring Donna forward and welcome her to the uh, podium. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, I guess I'm on, yeah. Thank you, uh, Paula, for such a great introduction. Um, haven't seen those pictures of me with Tony Blair for quite some time. Maybe it's time to bring him back in the UK. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about, there'll be some kinetics in this, but it's actually going to be a little bit broader topic and more general, um, something that we've been working on really for about 20 years in my lab, uh, the origin of biological homochirality. But before I get to that, I can't uh, start uh, the seminar without noting this week is actually a big week for MIT as well, because uh, Barry Sharpless was your own. Uh, he did the work for his first Nobel Prize when he was here at MIT. He did this work for his second at Scripps, and he just was awarded that this week. And it's a lovely graphic that I, I uh, see with the three Nobel laureates there. Um, and one of the things that that made us think about was um, whether or not Barry is going to actually get two parking places now, because he has one. And it turns out that he doesn't park very well. He's always over the line. So maybe it is a good thing for him to get two parking places at Scripps uh, with this new prize. So we're very, very proud of him. And he's been an incredible mentor to me. I could tell Barry's stories uh, all day. Maybe we'll do that at dinner. Um, but anyway, uh, just to go on to what I'm going to talk about today, it actually, uh, he was a, um, a real inspiration to me in, in my early work in asymmetric catalysis, and the whole subject of chirality, which was his first Nobel Prize, is one that, that I think fascinates both uh, scientists and lay people alike. Uh, the, the, the fact that molecules can have handedness, and uh, the only difference between the two hands is that they're mirror images, but they have pretty much identical properties. Um, but our life on Earth um, is, is actually based on only one of the two hands for most of the biological molecules. Um, so uh, the single-handedness of the sugars that make up DNA and RNA and the, um, uh, and the, and the, the other handedness that makes up uh, the amino acids and proteins and peptides um, is really considered to be a signature of life. It's one of the things that when NASA thinks about going in outer space that they try to uh, l look for um, uh, an imbalance in asymmetric, in enantiomeric excess as possibly as a signature of life. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we think about it a lot. But the really, that brings up the question of like, how did we get here from there? I mean, if you think about the beginning of the world, um, the, the prebiotic soup when the first molecules were being, were being formed, um, they had to be making an equal mixture, racemic mixture of left and right without any, anything to direct, the, uh, to template the reaction going one way or another. Um, which is the way we do it today. I mean, chiral catalysts that Barry Sharpless developed are templates to go to make the reaction go in, to one hand or the other. So the question has two parts. One is, how do you break that symmetry? If you start with a 50-50 mixture, how do you get it to, to go tip it a little bit one way or the other? But that isn't enough, really, for life. You actually have to then amplify that. You have to find a way to propagate that initial um, uh, uh, symmetry breaking. So we've worked on both parts of this. I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, about both parts of this. But this, the area of research in origin of life um, is, is a it's an interesting field, and probably not that different from other fields. It, it, it has a lot of silos. 
People work in the basic molecules, uh, building blocks of life. They work on the informational polymers that those molecules make. They work on things like systems chemistry, the emergence of properties um, or in, in compartments. Um, and a separate silo is chirality. You don't find the people in the first three fields, really three silos working, you know, thinking much about chirality. And so we kind of think of chirality as the, it's like the elephant in the room. Okay, yeah, you've, you've got a method for making RNA, but how did you get the D-ribose, you know, and only D-ribose that, that you put into the RNA? So my, my work in this field has really been, sometimes by myself and sometimes with collaboration with other people, trying to bring chirality into the question of origin of life. Um, and so we've, like I said, I've been working on this for 20 years, and we've worked on models. Really, there was almost no experimental work until the late 90s, mid 90s, the last the last decade of the 20th century. Um, and then one of the uh, articles in Chemistry World, the British sort of equivalent of CNE News, at one point said, you know, we used to have no model, no experimental data, and now we're spoiled for choice. Um, and so we've actually worked on, I sort of divided into four different vignettes of different, different ways that we could either get an imbalance or propagate that imbalance. Um, and uh, so I could give a seminar each, on each of these separately, but I'm going to do a whirlwind tour of all of them for you. I hope it's not going to be too, uh, well, it should be done by 6 or 6.30. I think, but because um, but I, I want to tell you about the different, because there's different chemical and physical rate processes, really, that I think appeals to chemical engineers um, involved in all of these different, uh, different vignettes. So I'll start out with the first one, which is autocatalysis, which is really the first thing that we worked on in this field. Um, and it really goes back to a report that was uh, from 1953. 1953 was a pretty good year for you know, biology or origin of life stuff, you know, the d DNA, uh, uh, this paper by Frank. Um, and he wrote a paper, it was a purely theoretical paper, no experiments at all. And he starts out, it's really great to read these old papers sometimes. It starts out, some colleagues told me that this is still a problem. And I, you know, I didn't know it was, but let me sort it out for you. <laughs> and, um, and he built a mathematical, very simple mathematical model, which basically said, if you can make yourself and somehow suppress your other hand, at least partially, the, you know, your opposite hand from being made, that's sufficient to, be, to get to homochirality, asymptotically to homochirality. The last sentence of the paper was what caught a lot of people's eyes. He said, he's a theoretician talking, saying, a laboratory demonstration may not be impossible. And so a lot of uh, synthetic organic chemists, including Hans Vinberg, who was a scientist in Groningen, said, now that is a challenge to any red-blooded chemist when a theoretician is gonna tell you you might be able to actually do this in the lab. And so people worked on this, tried to think of a reaction that would have those properties, that it could be a catalyst to make itself, and also have this suppression. You have to actually have the suppression as well. I'll show you in a minute. Um, and it was, the challenge was finally met. Actually, uh, 40 years later, uh, Kenzo Sowai published a paper in Nature, which has been called one of the top 50 papers of the fa last 50 years in Nature. Um, and it's now called the Sowai reaction. And it's, a, uh, it's an alkylation of dialkyl zinc alkylation of an aldehyde, a pyrimidyl aldehyde, and um, the catalyst is the product. And basically it's the alkyl oxide of the, of the catalyst is the, is, uh, is, of the product is the catalyst. And you can put this in at very low and antimeric excess, so you have both hands of this guy, and you will get out increasingly higher in antimeric excess as it goes along. And so it was a real revelation. It's the only reaction at that point, and it still is today the only reaction that actually has these features. So it serves as a really great model for this Frank uh, idea, although anybody that's tried to do dialkyl zinc chemistry in an aqueous uh, reaction is going to find out this doesn't work very well, right? It's, so it's a model reaction. It's not really going to be our answer to the origin of homochirality. But it served as a great um, model, and so there's another challenge out there for somebody to find a prebiotically relevant reaction that can do this. So our first foray into this was together with John Brown at Oxford, and we built, essentially I knew it was going to be about kinetics because you can, how, you know, if you're making more catalysts every time you turn over the reaction, you, initial rates aren't really going to help you very much, right? You better be looking at the reaction progress. And so we, we, had, we did some really nice, we had beautiful reaction calorimetry technique for looking at the reaction rate. And we built a model that was based on nonlinear effects. Uh, Henri Cagan developed this, this model for, called nonlinear effects, which says that if I put in a certain reagent with a, with a certain enantiomeric excess, um, and I, but, but I get out uh, something that, that is either higher or lower than I expected from that. It's called a nonlinear effect. And he, he, he set up a model called ML2 
model for, um, for catalysis. So we modified it for autocatalysis. Basically, the idea is that every time you make a product in this reaction, it wants to become a dimer. So it looks around, and if it's an S and it finds an S, it makes an SS. If it looks around and finds an R, it makes an RR. Um, and so we, we but, but all three of them, the heterochiral and the two homochirals, they could all be catalysts. So we asked the model, we gave it the kinetic data that's in blue, and asked it to find us the equilibrium constant between these dimers um, as one parameter, and the other parameter was the relative rate. The, the, the SS and RR are enantiomers. They have to have the same rate as catalysts, and the SR could have some other rate, which would be G times this rate. And it turns out that K equals 4 and G equals 0. And I was very excited. I jumped up and when I got the, was doing the model, and everybody told me, Donna, get a life. <laughs> K equals 4, G equals 0. And I'll try to explain why I think that was so important. Um, but basically, so the model was based just on these kinetics. But the model could also then predict what the amplification would be for those two reactions that started at two different EEs you know, over the course of the conversion, what the product EE would do. And then, of course, we can measure that with HPLC. That's a completely separate measurement than the kinetics for the reaction. And it gave us this. So that looked pretty good. It's not a fit through those lines. Those, those lines are not a fit through those data points. That's actually a, a, a separate independent measurement. So the model predicted that. And that was, um, I think, what was really exciting was is that the, chiro the kinetic data in this very, very simple model could predict the amplification um, um, directly. And so why is that uh, K equals, let's, let's deal with K equals 4 first. John Brown, uh, um, in, in his labs, looked at NMR and basically confirmed what the model said, which is that basically if you have a racemic mixture, you should have two homochiral and two heterochiral molecules. And so we got very close to that. So why is that interesting for origin of life? Because I think it's interesting because it's a statistical uh, distribution. You didn't need to have any bias in the system. When you make an asymmetric cata catalyst today, you have to put in elements that make it want to go one way or the other. And this, it said, I don't care. If I'm an S, if I find an S, I'll be an SS. If I find an R, I'll be an SR. I have no preference at all. And we don't need it, as long as we've got the, amp the um, amplification mechanism, the, the, the uh, suppression mechanism of G equals zero. And so that's where G equals zero comes in. Typically, you know, basically you have a major and a minor catalyst. They can be very close. They can be you know, a, a large amount of one, small amount of the other. But when they're catalysts, you know, the RR catalyst goes around and makes more of itself. But if it even makes a mistake you know, very, very, uh, you know, not very often, it makes the S product, that product can then go around and make, you know, ha hang out with an S, another S to make more of the S than the R. And if you have that, system there, you, you cannot get amplification. You can't even break even. <laughs> so you basically, you need to have some other uh, uh, inhibition. Like the Frank model said, you need an inhibition mechanism. And so what that is, is our inactive heterochiral species. Because if you pull off one S and one R from here, you don't actually have to pull all the S's off, but th that's a one-to-one -one, um, pulling off. And so you decrease, either completely or partially, the, the minor product going around and making itself. So G equals zero is important because, I mean, it's actually quite lucky. You know, the statistical uh, distribution of dimers was great because we didn't need any special chemistry in the prebiotic world to do that. But G equals zero was the luck of the draw, really, that the heterochiral compound was not active. And so this, this actually shows you why the Frank model could work and why, how you could get to homochirality from this, um, this case. So when I talk to the chemists, they always want to know what the structure is of the catalyst. And we had talked in the first paper about whether we could have a species that was a heterochiro, a macrocyclic dimer or the square dimer. And John Brown and I both, I like this one, he liked this one. Um, but it turns out that um, what we think now is that it's tetramers. And if, this, if we still have a statistical distribution, the model for dimers will be exactly the same. So the, the math of the model still works. And we, it turns out we didn't have to choose between those two dimers because basically we've got a, a macrocyclic dimer with two heterochiral, uh, two, two square dimers uh, attached to it. Um, and we proposed this from first from our kinetic data and then spectroscopic data that John Brown took. And then Kenzo Sowai showed the crystal structure. So that is the structure of the Sowai catalyst. So Sowai went on to do all kinds of, he never did any mechanistic work, but he just kept finding new ways to do this reaction. The same thing, but with different components. 
we know the SOI reaction product catalyzes its own uh, formation. You can throw in a chiral alcohol. You can shine circularly polarized light on this reaction. You can, in one direction and then the other direction, uh, and make it go faithfully one way or the other. You can put in chiral minerals, like quartz is chiral. If you put right-handed quartz in, you get one SOI product. Left-handed quartz, you get the other. I mean, it's amazing how many different ways that you can make this reaction faithfully go one way or the other. And it's because it keeps building up over time. You might get a tiny EE in the beginning, but each of those things gets amplified by the mechanism I just showed you. But the really cool thing that he published a little bit more than a decade ago was the use of isotopically chiral initiators. We talked about chiral alcohols, but you can make alcohols where the only difference between the left and the right is an isotope. It could be, he did it with 12 and 13 C, with 14 and 15 nitrogen, oxygen, and HD. And so basically, we're, we decided, again, with no mechanistic, like, how is this working? You know? And his idea was is that, that this is a catalyst to make this reaction go. So we decided to study it with this particular uh, chiral initiator um, to see what was going on. And it turns out it's not a catalyst. It's actually an in in inhibitor. This actually inhibits the reaction. We actually, this reaction will go without any catalyst. There's a background reaction, which would turn out to be racemic, it would go both ways. And the background reaction happens for quite some time before the autocatalysis takes off. And what happens during that time is that you're making a complex. Because this, this period here and the amount that you, that you, that you make of the, of, the, of the initial, the amount that you use up of the initial pyramidal aldehyde is correlated with how much of this initiator you put in. And so by NMR spectroscopy, both hydrogen and deuterium, which is really cool to see it both ways, with um, dozy measurements from NMR and DFT calculations, we, um, we propose that there's a two to one product to initiator complex that's formed. That has to be completely formed before there's any more free product to go and do its autocatalysis on its own, to make its own um, dimer or tetramer. So the initiator actually inhibits the autocatalysis. And then once you've, you've finished making this, this guy, um, the burst comes and you do the autocatalysis. And then you can make the self-dimers with, with the product of the reaction. Um, so how does that get us EE, though? The way we think about it is, is that, this, this, um, the, the, that the, the, um, you make this complex and you make two different ones you know, with, with your S product or your R product of the reaction. Um, he, you, when you use one hand of the initiator, um, you, may, you make these complexes. But they may have a slightly different stability. And that dif slight difference in stability results in a tiny difference in the amount of S and R that are left over once you've made that, that, um, that uh, dimer, the, the, the inhibitor complex, the initiator complex. And so once it starts, this difference is what gives you the, the um, uh, amplifying autocatalysis. And so it's this parameter alpha, which is the difference between these two. If this was equal, then we would go in both dire directions equally. But because we have a slight imbalance, we can, we can amplify one side faster than the other. This side will still go. It, there'll be some products, but we'll make more of the R, and so we'll get the amplification. Um, so, so that's an interesting model, and it, 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 we wanted to try to find out how small is this difference? Is this something that we could have actually put in ourselves, a tiny difference in R and S? Um, but, but the real interesting thing is, is, can this tell us something about what kind of energy difference do we need to tip this reaction? You know, how, how small is that energy that makes it go one way or the other? We've seen all these different ways that we can make this reaction happen, faithfully going one way or the other, but how much... Um, tipping, how much energy do we need to push it one way versus the other? Um, and so to answer that question, we have to take a break here. And I, I know there's a couple physicists in the audience um, going to talk about fundamental forces. Um, there are four fundamental forces. Gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong force all exhibit parity inversion. The weak force does not exhibit parity inversion. This may not sound like it matters for what I'm talking about, but it really does. Parity inversion is the way a physicist or a mathematician would talk about, we talk, you know, it's like the analogy to chirality. It's, it's basically converting, uh, it's an operation that converts you know, a phenomenon or a molecule, in our case, uh, into its mirror image. So why does it matter, the parity uh, inversion? Um, so, so first of all, this was discovered in the 1950s. It was a theoretical paper by Li and Yang in uh, 1956, completely theoretical paper. Nobody believed them, okay? Wolfgang Pauli, this is a great article by Martin Quack. Uh, you gotta read this if you're interested. But he goes through this whole thing. Mar Wolfgang Pauli said that's not true, and he bet champagne, I think a case of champagne to somebody that this couldn't be true. Uh, Richard Feynman didn't believe it. He lost a $50 bet, although he said it's kinda cool if it does happen. 
So within months of this, another Chinese-American scientist, Xincheng Wu, devised an experiment to prove it. And they all worked together. They were all, and then Dick Garwin and Leon Letterman at Columbia, I guess, were also working. And they came up with an experiment they published in the same issue that, that Wu published hers. Um, and so it was clear from these experiments that it did work. Parity was, you know, the, the weak force did violate parity. So, you know, normally it takes people like 10 years to win a Nobel Prize, you know, from their work. Well, in 1957, these guys won the Nobel Prize in physics. And they gave it to the two men. Xincheng Wu was not on that prize. And nobody believed it until she showed that it worked. So what the heck? So my physicist friends tell me that it was not just gender, that it was actually this snobbishness about theoreticians versus experimentalists. But anyway, I think, I think they realized they had missed something because she got the inaugural Wolf Prize. And she had a fantastic career, did a lot of great things. But it's an interesting story that um, nobody believed the theoreticians until the experimentalists showed it, and then they left her out. But anyway, so why do we care about this? It's because actually parity violation, um, you know, first of all, it's the only reason that we're here today. Because matter and antimatter, I think I have this on here. Yeah, matter and antimatter um, would completely annihilate each other if the weak force was, was symmetric. So thank goodness that parity, violate, parity was violated because we're here today. <laughs> so people think that possibly there could have been another bifurcation if, because parity violation energy difference actually then t told people, and within a few years, people started realizing, well, that means that what we tell students every day in organic chemistry, that the, these two enantiomers are exactly the same. They have the same properties. Macroscopically, they do. But they actually have a tiny energy difference between them because of parity violation. So the idea was, could that have caused our biosphere bifurcation so that that's the reason we're all left-handed amino acids? It's a very, very small number. <laughs> it's never been directly observed. It's been calculated. And the calculations are getting better and better. Uh, Martin Quack, who I mentioned, is one, if anybody's going to actually measure it, he will. He's an emeritus now, but he's still trying to measure this. But, um, but anyway, so, so that, that's the kind of number that we're looking at. Is that enough to push us one way or the other? And so we may not answer that question, but I think I might be able to at least answer what kind of energy the SOI reaction needs to tip. And so if we go back to this model, you know, we used um, an antiopure uh, uh, initiator, but what if we put both hands in? You know, we should get basically both, both things going. We should get racemic product if we put in a racemic mixture of these, of these isotopically chiral initiators. So somewhere in between enantiopure and racemic, we should lose the definition, the fidelity of going one way or the other. So could we just systematically lower the EE of the initiator that we add um, and so that we can actually see where we lose, where we start to get, you know, uh, racemic mixtures of the product? So basically, we want to um, measure, uh, put, put this into our model that we've already developed, the kinetic model, so that we can calculate what this energy difference is between the major and the minor uh, uh, product complexes. And then this difference here, how small can this be between the R and the S to actually give us a, 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 an amplification or an asymmetry that can be propagated, that doesn't fall back into the noise? And, and so, so we need to calculate what product EE will, will, will that give us? So we, we did the experiments first. It's actually quite hard to make this initiator with Ds on one side and Hs on the It's actually hard to measure what you made. So we actually managed to make the S only an 85% EE and 97 for the R. So we did most of the work with the R. But anyway, as we lowered this EE, you can see that somewhere between 0.1 and 0.1% EE, we start to lose. It goes both ways. So I don't, I'm not really bothered by what number that is, but somewhere in between those, I can calculate what energy that means. OK, so what does it mean? Well, we can put this into our model. And we, can, we, we already have a kinetic model. We can add the steps for the initiator and add noise to each step, stochastic model, so that we can calculate what happens at different values of g. And basically, what, what we find is that at 0.1% EE, we, we're sort of getting, you know, going both ways. This is alpha, this number here. And if it goes symmetrically both ways, we're getting no amplification. But you can see as you go at 1% EE, as you go down to 2.2%, uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 6, we're tending to go almost always the other way. And this alpha crit, it's called alpha critical because if you take this little box, if you um, get beyond this, this alpha crit, you're not turning around. This guy actually turned around, you can see. And this guy turned around. And this guy, uh, actually, I think he turned around as well. But so basically, the number that, that, you, that you're not looking back. If you get to alpha crit of 5.8 times 10 to the minus 11 molar, you're not looking back. You're going on in that direction. 
And so the question is, what do these numbers mean? Two times 10 to the sixth? That's a very small difference between these two. It's no wonder that we really weren't able with DFT calculations to see a real difference between the two structures that I showed you for the, for the initiator complex. But from that, uh, from that alpha crit, we could actually calculate that the product EE that we would need to have to direct the stereochemistry faithfully one way or the other is between three, uh, three, 10 to the minus 7 and 10 to the minus 8th percent EE. That's really small. The lowest that's ever been measured, so I tried to measure this. He measured a, a system that down to 10 to the minus 5 um, uh, percent EE. And he did it. He made a 2 liter uh, bought, uh, flask, and he put in one drop of the ex of the of you know, racemic mixture, and he put in one drop of the other hand into a two liter flask, and then he decided that was too hard. He couldn't do that experiment anymore, and you can see we're like two orders of magnitude lower than that. So we tried to think like wh how what experiment would we do to show this? It turns out what you could do would be essentially take twenty milligrams and put it in an Olympic sized swimming pool. <laughs> Now we don't tend to do our reactions in swimming pools. You know, it's expensive, but um, but but that's that's essentially how small it is. This reaction is so amazingly um, faithful. You know, it can be tipped very very easily one way or the other by very small energy difference. But but how does that compare to what we just learned about parity violation energy difference? Well, you can take that EE and you can calculate what that means for like a delta delta G, and it's ten to the minus eighth. We're still <coughs> quite a ways off from this. So my conclusion, now other people, you can talk to Dilip Kondapudi, who's a fantastic thermodynamicist, who has other ways that you could push this, even with these numbers like this. Um, but you know, it, it seems unlikely that parity violation energy difference is the reason that we're all left-handed amino acids, because also some of the calculations show that not, the L is not always more stable than the D. It depends on the molecule. So, um, so that's just, the SOA reaction is not prebiotically relevant, but it just gives us a feeling. This is an amazingly, you know, faithful, you know, the fidelity of this reaction is just amazing, and it's still far away, orders of magnitude away from what we think parity violation uh, energy difference would be. So just to summarize that, um, so the SOA reaction, again, was just a, a, a nice model. It's the only one out there. There's been a couple of the reactions that people have said they thought were doing the same kind of, um, have the same features, but they've never been proven the way the SOI reaction. So challenge to everybody out there, like this, like the one SOI answered, is find a prebiotically relevant, um, uh, you know, plausible to do it in, in a prebiotic soup reaction that does what the SOI reaction does. And if you can find that, you'll probably be a Nobel Prize winner someday. So back to our, the different models, I'm going to turn to the other end and start looking at physical models, looking at how chiral molecules crystallize. Basically, the two main ways are as conglomerates or racemic compounds. Conglomerates are separate crystals of D and separate crystals of L. Uh, racemic compounds have, make DL, DL, DL as the most stable structure. So um, we've actually developed a model that can, can, two different models that deal with the two different cr kinds of crystals. Racemic compounds, we're going to talk about this eutectic partitioning. And with conglomerates, we'll talk about this attrition-enhanced deracemization. Only about 10% of chiral molecules crystallize this way. So you kind of need, if you're going to use crystallization or physical properties, you're going to need more than, more than just one model. So first, the crystal engineering part. Um, so like I said, most of the pro like 17 of the 19 proteinogenic amino acid crystallize like this, L's and D's next to each other. So if you imagine having a system where you've got a racemic mixture or an antiopure, they each have their own solubility, right? If you look at the, how it, it's in equilibrium with its solution phase. This will be racemic, this will be an antiopure. The question is, what happens in between? If you've got both solids and solutions, so you've got solid solution, ternary phase equilibria, um, you, know, you, have, you go down more, less and less of this heterochiral solid and more and more of the homochiral. What happens is they each exhibit their own solubility. They don't actually, if there's no interactions in solution, they don't know the other guy's there. They're just doing their own thing, putting molecules in solution according to their own rule for solubility. But, and, and that will depend on the particular molecule, what the solubility of this guy is and this guy. So um, that looks to me like an amplification mechanism. So if you measure the, the eutectics of various proteinogenic amino acids, you get lots of numbers. Most of them are around, or 50% or higher. Threonine is actually one of the conglomerates, so its eutectic EE is zero. It crystallizes as a conglomerate. Um, but so if we could do chemistry like serine, serine is like the, the solution above a, a solid solution equilibrium with serine will be almost an antiopure. Its, it's, it's heterochiral solid is incredibly insoluble. 
And we could actually demonstrate this with chemistry. Um, and that actually goes back to last year's Nobel Prize for organocatalysis. This is the actually the um, um, uh, indirect, the direct uh, aldol condens aldol reaction catalyzed by various amino acids that Ben List actually was a postdoc at, at Scripps when he did the work that led to the Nobel Prize last year. So we just carried out uh, the aldol reaction um, with a, a bunch of different amino acids. And we could see that essentially each one gives the, the reaction happens in the solution phase. So what we're seeing is, is it's a reporter or a marker for the solution phase EE of that amino acid. And serine, 1% serine gives the same EE in that aldol reaction as an antiopure because the, the solution is at 99% EE. And you can see each of these, they cross this uh, diagonal where their eutectic point was. You know, leucine is at 87%, alanine at 60, valine at 46 or 47. And um, so, so clearly, if you want to do chemistry and solution, this eutectic model, if you have enough you know, uh, sol solid and solution equilibria going on, they will partition themselves by thermodynamics working for you to give you an amplification mechanism. And it turns out that you can, you're not really, you don't have to just rely on these eutectic points. You can change them. You can tune them. We found this out kind of by mistake. We did this same reaction that in DMSO, you get about 50% EE. But in pro, it, it, with, pro, with proline in chloroform, we get 99% EE. And, and it, turned, it took us a while to figure out, but we actually make a co-solvate. There's a chloroform molecule in this structure, which changes the solubility, makes this guy like completely insoluble. And it's like um, uh, cement. Okay. Cement is limestone and water, right? What happens is you make a co-solvate when you mix limestone and water, and that crashes out as cement because it's so totally insoluble. And that's what happens with chloroform and, um, and proline. So we just decided to do a survey to try to see what other kinds of things. We looked at, tried, tried to look at periodically relevant molecules that have been found on meteorites and things. And this series of dicarboxylic acid, you can see you can increase or decrease the EE. So you, you're able to tune this, this, this property of the molecule um, uh, by eutectic partitioning. So you might not really be stuck with the hand that, that, that you were dealt by nature because, um, for instance, you know, uh, valine was you know, 46, 47, and now when we add fumaric acid, we can get it up to 99. Same thing with phenylalanine. We can increase um, those. And there's probably other molecules that could do that too. So it was an appealing model because uh, it's thermodynamics. Time is on our side. You know, I'm usually talking about kinetics. So this is thermodynamics. And, you know, basically if you could um, imagine in a prebiotic world, if you have cycles of rain and, and drying up, that you could get a, a three-phase equilibrium with, with these molecules, and then you could sit there with your solution phase at 99% E waiting for other stuff to happen, right? Molecules to come in to use these as building blocks to make peptides or as catalysts to make other molecules. So a completely thermodynamic model. Okay, so that's one of the physical models. The other physical model, attrition-enhanced deracemization, deals with the other type of solid, which is ones that crystallize separately. This is the one that pharma companies love these molecules because they're much easier to do, think about separations when they're not stuck together in a crystal, right, L and D. But only, like I said, only about 10% of molecules, chiral molecules known to man crystallize this way. But when they do, um, it's like Pasteur's, you know, what Pasteur separated with his tweezers. You've all heard the story about him seeing the, the disold of tartaric acid and realizing that they, they looked like crystals that, that, were, that were mirror images. Um, and so in, in 2005, actually there was work done that was halted by the war. You know, Havinga published, this, uh, published a paper early on and was doing some work in, in Holland, but, you know, stopped by the war and never really got the credit for this. But Christopher Viedma showed this um, in 2005 with um, sodium chlorate, which is not a, a, a chiral molecule. It's not even an organic molecule, but it crystallizes as two separate crystals. And in solution, it's just an ion. So it forgets what chirality it had as a solid. That's why I called it chiral amnesia. Jack Dunnett said that was the most forgettable term he's ever heard. I still like it, but anyway, you can decide by the end if you think it's, it's, it's a good description. Because basically what happens is you've got L crystals and D crystals, and, if you could, and they're going to be communicating with their solution phase. But if you make them communicate in solution as well, you have a conduit that you could actually go from L crystals all the way over to D crystals. And it turns out if you stir these reactions for a day, it inevitably goes all the way to one or the other. If you do 10 reactions, five times goes left, five times goes right. There's no, 
there's no um, bias, but it definitely all goes, and, and it's not just um, partitioning like we saw before, it's actually turning one into the other. Um, so, you know, basically you start with two enantiomorphic solids, you, rat, you have a base in the solution to help racemize so that they, they go back and forth in solution, and you can turn all the blue ones into, into pink ones in, in the period of, of, for sodium chlorate by 24 hours. So, um, so once we realized what was going on with Cristobal Viedmas, we, we thought, you know, we should do this with real chiral molecules. What's the, what's the um, analogy to sodium chlorate forgetting that it was an L crystal of chlorate in solution? That the analogy for chiral molecules is racemization. Ls forget that they were Ls, become Ds, and then they could end up on a D crystal. So um, actually, we sent it to Nature. They didn't take it. We published it in JAX, but they let Nature write a news and views about. And it was like one sentence of the news and the rest was his view. Uh, my, uh, Mike McBride and John Tully wrote a news and views about this, but it was a nice comment. That this is a, a really a new way of separating chiral crystals or isolating chiral crystals. So basically, we tried to think about how it works. And one thing that we did was we put a, a label on just on the amide, I think, on the nitrogen, so that we could follow if we make all this one with labeled nitrogen or all this one, and we followed just to see where the molecules end up over time. And we found out that where they end up over time isn't necessarily how they, um, how they convert from one to the other over time. If you look at this, there, this one here, by three hours, we're basically completely washed out. A molecule that was here within three hours has just a prob the same probability of being over here. But it doesn't necessarily have the probability of everybody moving over there. You know, a net movement of molecules is different. So this one went, this one didn't go. We have four of these. Two went, one went one way, one went the other way, and two stayed racemic for the five hours that we looked at it. So there's something else that's triggering the net movement of the molecules that we tried to look at. And we looked at three cases where they, one went right, one went left, one went down the middle. And we took samples at, at, th at three, five, and eight hours. And at the beginning, before they started, we have essentially uh, similar crystallized, I mean, they were from the same batch, these three. We just did crystal sizes of all of them. At five hours, right when we have converted, we've just done this, this, this fast conversion, um, uh, the one that didn't go, the one that stayed racemic, is still narrow, and the other two have broadened their distribution. It, at eight hours, we're back to similar to where we were in the beginning. So there's a, a transient change in crystal size, okay? And what does that, how does that help us? Well, Gibbs-Thompson rule says that, that solubility, we think of solubility as just a number, right? The solubility of an amino acid. That's considered, that's essentially for an infinite planar surface of that amino acid. But you make a, a, a crystal, you make a, 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 um, a, a sphere, and you, you change the solubility because of the Gibbs-Thompson rule. You have to get really small for it to, to, to matter. But basically, if you could, just by chance, have the crystals on the right side be bigger than the crystals on the left side. And you do this by this grinding that, you know, it speeds it up. It might happen anyway over time, but basically the grinding that Cristobal Viedma found, kind of by mistake, good story also how he found that. But basically you can get big crystals that say, oh wait, um, you know, I'm, you know, uh, I need more crystals from, I need more molecules from solution. I'm too big a particle. And on the other side, the small crystals say, oh, I should put more molecules in solution. And that can be a feedback that can turn, the same way that you do with diastereomers. If, if you work, if you know about pharma um, separations, diastereomers have different probabilities. It's, it's Dimroth's principle that basically you can turn all of one diastereomer into the other because the solubilities of the two can be different and the interconversion. You know, there's a chemical rule that, that they're trying to follow and then there's physical rules. And if those rules are out of balance, it, the, the, the process keeps feeding forward until you end up with only one crystal. And so we're, we're proposing that it's a transient process that, that gives us a, a difference in solubility that's induced by different crystal sizes. And it's random. We can't do this with everybody. It's only 10% of chiral molecules, like I said, but it's a really great way of doing it. And it's actually used, being used at DSM Pharma now because it's great. You have a batch of the, um, clopridogrel, the, the um, blockbuster drug Plavix, um, uh, we, we actually converted it all the way from one to the other with this, and they can just throw a little bit in the batch and make it all go the other way and just save some from each batch to throw in the next. It's kind of like a sourdough starter or something. <laughs> but, um, but, but the other thing that's interesting is we also calculated, this is, much, this is a 
closer to thermodynamics, this process, then the so the so our reaction, you call that far from equilibrium, right? It, it gets tipped and it's off and running. As soon as you break out of that alpha crit, you're off and running, you're not coming back. This process keeps trying to get back to equilibrium. You push it a little bit, it tries to go back. So it takes more energy, 0.1 kilocalories per mole compared to what would we say, 10 to the minus eighth for the so I reaction. So, um, but it's another possibility for some molecules, and this might be something that you could think about um, uh, uh, that, that could have happened you know, in, a, in a prebiotic world. Okay, so the last part is just the, the um, going back more to chemistry. And this is kind of where our work is going now, is trying to work with uh, prebiotic chemists to bring chirality into the reactions that they're trying to develop that are prebiotically relevant. Um, and so there's two parts to this, and it's the two building blocks, essentially sugars and amino acids. And if you think about, if you think about the very first chiral center that's formed, in sugars it's glyceraldehyde, the center, and in amino acids they typically come from amino nitriles. That would be the first chiral center. Um, in a, in a, so let's take a look at what we can do, what kind of reactions we can do with these. So first the sugars. Um, so the RNA world, the RNA world is a hypothesis that um, a lot of people believe, a lot of people don't. You can get into really big fights at meetings because nobody has a time machine. And so everybody can push for their model without actually having any proof uh, one way or the other. Anyway, one of the problems with, the idea is the RNA world, RNA is a molecule that can make itself and it can catalyze other reactions. So it could be a life form on its own, right? Maybe that was life before DNA, it's simpler. Um, you know, uh, it's not as um, stable, so maybe that's why it didn't last. But anyway, so a lot of people think that RNA, and then RNA could then give us the machinery to make peptides. So maybe all our work with amino acids is like not needed. Maybe all we have to do is solve for glyceraldehyde uh, and then we're done. But anyway, the idea, the problem that a lot of people faced was that the idea that you can't really find a prebiotically way to put ribose and a nucleobase together to make um, an RNA monomer. And so a lot of people said, no, the RNA world doesn't, can't exist. John Sutherland, who was at Manchester at the time, is now at the MRC in Cambridge, came up with his student, Matt Pounder, this reaction where it's like, okay, we're going to bypass ribose. We don't need to go to ribose. We can just take glyceraldehyde, two amino oxazole, make this riboamino oxazoline, shine light, another step, we get an RNA monomer. And it was great reaction. It was like a real breakthrough in, in the field. He was in the New York Times. It, was, it, it really got a lot of press. But the interesting thing, you know, he's making these activated primitive nucleotides from very simple precursors that would have been around. So that, that was what the real big deal about this was. But he had to start with deglyceraldehyde to get to this. You know, he, he, and so where did that come from? You know, and he said, that's your problem, Donna. You work on that. So, um, so we did. So we decided to just look at what additives we could do to push this reaction one way or the other. We, we just thought, let's test amino acids. And we tested a whole bunch. And the one that really stood out was proline, um, that we could make this amino ox, uh, the, the uh, ribose amino oxazoline with a pretty high EE, 55%. And it turned out that we made a byproduct. They all make, all these reactions make a byproduct, a medium amount of this byproduct. And it turned out that it's a, a, a three component reaction. The proline ends up in this structure, glyceraldehyde, two amino oxazole, and the proline. And, um, and what the really interesting thing was is that the natural hand of the amino acid sequesters the unnatural hand of the proline. So if this were a, a prebiotically relevant reaction, uh, if we were in pre prebiotic world and we had more of the natural hand of the amino acid, more L amino acid, um, we could actually do this reaction and it would try to take out from the racemic glyceraldehyde more of the L uh, glyceraldehyde, leaving the D behind, which is what we want, right? So basically that's what happens, is that you have both of these glyceraldehydes. This one goes off to the th more to the three component reaction. You can get really high um, an anti-enrichment of deglyceraldehyde. Um, and you actually don't even need that high because the riboamino oxazoline that you make crystallizes. If you're above about 20% EE, if you're above about here, um, you get these beautiful crystals. You can get the beautiful crystals of the, of the, of the RNA precursor um, that are enantiopure. So again, physical and chemical uh, processes can work together to get you um, this uh, enantioenrichment. So what I just showed you, amino acids are mediating the enantioenrichment of sugars. Can we do it the other way? Can sugars uh, uh, mediate the enantioenrichment of amino acids? Um, and so this is going to the amino nitriles that I mentioned. So amino nitriles, we, we looked at a bunch of different sugars for catalyzing this reaction, and we found, I'm going to show you D-ribose, uh, can make the amino amide, which we call ALA2, and then the amino acid called ALA3. So we started to do this reaction, and um, it looked like 
we weren't making any amino acid at all. Like this is 600 minutes and the, the, the amino nitrile is gone. We haven't made any amino acid and we look like we're steady with the amino um, amide. We do have a little bit of a, um, uh, well, we'll show you that, that in a minute. The mass balance starts to go away. Now, if you look, I've changed the, the x-axis. This is 600 all the way to 10,000 minutes now, but look what happens. We start losing the amino amide and it goes to the amino nitrile. Sorry, sorry, to the amino acid. And it does it with uh, high EE. We're getting up to 70% EE to the amino nitrile here in this case. But you can see here we don't have a mass balance anymore. We're losing this, we're getting this, but we didn't get as much as we lost. So is there an intermediate that we can identify? And so we did. We looked at that by NMR. And it turns out that the amino, that the, the, we make an, um, a, a sugar, an amino sugar or a glycan. It's good for this week, you know. It's like the prebiotic version of some of Carolyn Batozzi's work, right? But anyway, we're, we're, we are making um, this uh, amino, uh, this intermediate, oops, on its way to, uh, to the amino acid. And, and when you're at the amino amide, um, sugar, you, D is dominating, but when you get here, L is dominating. And so the product that we're getting out is going to be higher in L than in D. And we can actually monitor this with kinetics. You start, we can start with this amino um, sugar here as a racemic mixture, and we can watch it go away. And it turns out we don't just make this guy, we actually also go back, go backwards to the amino amide. And, um, and you can actually, from this and from the E values, you can calculate the relative rates. So we're making the amino, the L uh, amino acid with a rate of one, about half that rate to make each of these going backwards to this guy, and then a tiny amount of the D goes on to L, and that's where we get the, the um, uh, enantioenrichment. And so you can also do calculations. They're very small energy differences, but what we were able to tell from this is that the um, th getting to the, the uh, from the, that intermediate sugar, amino sugar A to the amino acid version of it is rate determining, but the enantiodetermining step comes f from here, going on from there uh, 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 to the amino acid. So for those two cases, you know, the thing I thought was really cool about it is, is that these things are synergistic. You know, the amino, sugar can en en enantioenrich the amino acids, the amino acid can enantioenrich, enantioenrich the sugar. And maybe that's all we really have to think about is you know, getting th this first center in various cases for the amino acids, but glyceraldehyde for the sugars. Maybe that's all we need to do. We, we don't have to think about it as a separate problem for other sugars. If we can get to, to, um, to you know, chirally pure ribose um, just from glyceraldehyde. So that's actually it. That's everything I had to say. I'll just summarize um, you know, each of the uh, things I've tried to tell you about. Uh, so, so now we are sort of spoiled for choice about what we think might have been happening uh, to get to homochirality. Um, again, this is a great model, but uh, not prebiotically relevant. These are good models that both could work in their cases when we have a conglomerate versus a, 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 a racemic compound. And then putting the, put it, trying to bring chirality with various additives into um, prebiotic reactions, trying to, trying to see how the building blocks could be made. Um, is kind of where most of our work is going uh, these days in the future. So with that, I will just conclude that um, we're basically trying to put prebiotically plausible syntheses together, you know, making the building blocks of life, but you have to consider chirality while you do it. And that's one of my problems. We had a discussion at lunch about, um, uh, I call it metabolis metabolism versus geneticism, but um, people talking about like deep sea vents and me metabolic, metabolic ways of thinking about the origin of life, most of them don't even mention, Nick Lane doesn't even mention the word chirality in his book. So I think we need to bring that word in um, because, you know, unless you have a way of, of, of uh, unless we can deliver all of them as nantiopure starting materials, then we have to bring it in somehow in the reactions. And actually, this was given. This is a picture given to me by Cristobal Viedma, who came up with the attrition-enhanced uh, deracemization. It's like it says here: you know, prebiotic soup made by C. Viedma, made with LD ingredients. And you, you imagine getting this spoon, and there's only L's and D's letters in the soup. Okay, so I just want to um, uh, acknowledge uh, uh, some of the people and the, and the um, funding for this. I started this work back when I was at Hull, went through Imperial College and, um, and then Scripps. So there's a lot of names on here, and I didn't really necessarily tell you who did what, but they were all important 
parts of this, plus a lot of contributors, um, uh, PI contributors along the way, and funding in the UK and in, and in the, the States. And specific, specifically, I want to uh, acknowledge the Simons Foundation, which has supported uh, origin of life work in this collaboration for 10 years. And basically everything from astrophysicists to, to geochemists to prebiotic chemists, RNA world people, it's been an amazing collaboration. We would meet three times a year at the Simons Foundation, and I felt like a groupie when the astronomers were talking and showing us pictures of. We actually helped sort of think about, help them think about where to land, uh, you know, the landing on Jezero Crater in, in um, Mars. So it's been a fantastic. We learned a lot from each other in this collaboration. So I just want to want to mention that really quickly. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is. Um, I, I did tell, showed you on the first slide, and it says it here also, John C. Martin Endowed Chair. John Martin was a, was a giant in the field of pharma research. He basically came up with the cocktail drugs for HIV and HCV. He's, um, he saved millions of lives, and he was just an amazing man. He died uh, uh, last year in 2021, tragically, uh, in an accident. You know, he, fell down, actually, and hit his head. And anyway, we were missing him every day. He was on our board of trustees. He was scheduled to become our, the, direct, the head of our board. Um, but anyway, he's, he did a lot for Scripps. He did a lot for the world. And his wife, Lily Liu, is now on our board. She runs a foundation where they are just doing amazing things, tr bringing um, drugs to uh, uh, underrepresented places around the world, in Africa and India, um, setting up clinics, not just giving drugs, but also making sure that they have the infrastructure to use those drugs. So I just want to mention them. Um, and with that, I'm happy to stop and answer any questions. Thank you. Before we take questions, we just have a short presentation for France, oh. for um, Donna, and my <laughs> Pittsburgh. That's Donna. gorgeous. <laughs> yes, you. this is uh, part of our tradition. It is a Revere oh, wow. Silver Bowl, and uh, it is the Hado Lecturer Award. Well, thank so you very thank much. Thank you so much for coming and giving this <laughs> thank incredible you. talk. Thank you for the inv invitation. I really appreciate it. Thank Thanks. <laughs> and uh, we're going to, to now take questions. Oops. <laughs> so uh, we have a mic, which I will help pass around. Let's see if we have questions. Yes. A physicist. <laughs> uh, thank you for the great talk, Donna. Uh, I have a question about the part that you talk about the SOI reaction and the number of ways to bias the reaction. You talked about like chiral mineral surfaces. Do you know the mechanism by which the reaction was like biased by the surface? I think every way that that reaction that he has shown with you know, circularly polarized light, chiral minerals, whatever, I think it's exactly the same thing. You somehow uh, disadvantage one of the product. Uh, that reaction that the, the catalyzes itself is the best reaction. None, no other reaction is going to beat that. So all you have to do is rein in one side a little bit, and then it takes off. And then because it keeps going, and you, you, you amplify that every time around, you make more and more you know, of, the, of, of the major enantiomer. So I think the only thing that any of those, um, those initiators do is to somehow have some mechanism to, like on quartz, it might be that it absorbs. The, um, the minor one a little bit more than the major one, you know, whichever, you know, and I forget which way it does it, but, um, but I, my, my belief now after working with the chiral initiators is that they're all doing the same thing. They're letting that reaction go and they're holding back one hand a little bit more than the other. Thank you. Um, thanks for that, Donna. That was great. I have a question about the last part where you were uh, talking, of course I do, about um, the sugar amino acid conjugates. And um, I guess one of the things that I was thinking of when I was looking at your model is that when you open the ring, you generate an aminium, which actually would facilitate uh, racemization. And so I wondered, you know, that wouldn't be a stable thing that you would necessarily isolate, but that could be actually the key 
intermediate in your chemistry. So it might, maybe this is a suggestion, but also a question, like, have you thought about that? And maybe that would be worth looking at in terms of stability to see if that is actually, could explain the results. Yeah, but if we, if we racemize, so, so on the way to the product, if we would racemize that, then I would think that if I'm, like, if I just let that sit for a long time, I should have end, end up with, with, which actually is a kinetic resolution I will anyway, right? Yes. End up, yeah. Yeah, um, so I, I, I guess I was just thinking, you know, you have the, you maintain the chirality of the sugar component. Yeah. You'd just be racemizing the other thing. And it's really neat the way you suggest it because it would be like this covalent yeah. linkage, yeah. but it'd be through the transient imine, imi, yeah. imine yeah. that might we don't. Occur. The only intermediates that we have any evidence for are the ones I showed you, which is, this, which is the, um, and, and it's interesting too because when we start out with the ribose, you know, we, Less than 0.1% is actually in the cyclic form. So when we first thought of this, you know, we were trying different sugars. We thought about it. The postdoc went and did ribose. I would have told him, don't do it because there's not going to be any of the, because we, we wanted it to be the, 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 the cyclic form to give us any kind of definition for the, but, but Le Chatelier helps us all because basically you, you get a little bit into that, then it pushes more and more of it. So I don't know the answer to that question. But um, one of the things that we're finding is that almost all the reactions that we're looking at now that are in conjunction with people doing prebiotic chemistry are all kinetic resolutions. That seems to be the biggest way of getting, but you also have to be really careful. You have got to make those molecules do something else before the wrong one falls, you know, comes along. Because in a kinetic, if you wait long enough, the wrong one will also react, right, and get there. So, you know, you basically have to, have to, uh, you have to do a little hand waving about what happens next. <laughs> you know, I can get you seventy percent EE for now, but um, but yeah. So we don't. I don't have any. Maybe calculations. I don't know whether we actually had an aminium on that uh, in our in our reaction coordinate for that. Yeah. So that yeah. I mean, the, the trouble is also that the EEs are low enough. You know, the selectivity factor for this is low enough that calculations are going to be hard pressed to tell us m much about. Differentiation. It might tell us whether an intermediate is possible, but whether it can be a, a, a um, chirally determining intermediate might be hard by calculations. This one? Any others? Okay. Yes, I see one. Hi. Is it on? Oh, there it is. Hey, thank you for a great talk. That was awesome. Uh, for your SOI reaction, I was wondering, um, have you or others looked at other metals besides zinc? Is it something unique about zinc? And you made the case for the, the coordination with the tetramer, but I'm wondering if something like copper perhaps could also facilitate that reaction. So, people, so I and others tried so many different, that reaction is so um, like, constrained. First of all, it has to be diisopropyl zinc. It can't be diethyl, dimethyl, diphenyl. Doesn't, doesn't, it's not autocatalytic then. It has to be in toluene or cumene. Can't be in DMSO or THF. It's not autocatalytic if it's in those. Uh, it has to be a pyrimidyl aldehyde or something else very similar. There's a couple of other molecules that have worked, but, um, but it has to be essentially that gamma coordination of the nitrogen uh, has to, has to be there, so it's a it's a it's incredibly limited <laughs> reaction. I mean, it, fantastic how it works. The trouble is, it's not very meaningful for origin of life, but it's and it's so beautiful. I mean, the, the data you get from it are you know it's really beautiful data. But um, as a kineticist, I love the <laughs> the data. But um, but no, almost nothing else worked. We've done reactions with other solvents, and we, we've actually shown how you can change the way things. Uh, Crystallize because this reaction, if you keep doing this over and over again, you start end up, you end up with a solid falling out, and then actually the heterochiral falls out before the homochiral, and so you change that k equals four a bit. But um, but the reaction itself is incredibly constrained for for how it what it, how how it works, and that's not really well understood. I don't think. I think you just can't make the kind of structures you would need, and that structure that tetramer doesn't. You would think that maybe it just keeps getting bigger. You know, it doesn't. Dozy, you know, NMR measurements show that that's it. It doesn't make a 
Aitmer or keep going, you'd think you would event, end, I mean, maybe if you crystallize it all out, it, would, it ends up in a structure, like so I showed. But in solution, it stays as that, that, that molecular weight. It doesn't change. So, you know, it's, it's, in itself, it's interesting. It's not for the, you know, the topic of origin of life. It's not that interesting, but it is, it, it is a really, it would be interesting to find out why it works so that we might be able to extend it to another reaction that might be more prebiotically relevant. But, but so I worked for years. If you follow his early papers, he had a 1992 chem rev. He was doing dialkyl zinc chemistry. You know, that's a very common thing that organic chemists do. And um, you just see all the things he tried. He even had a little note towards the end about how this might be autocatalytic. And, and, um, but, uh, and, and, and Hans Vinberg worked for years, the guy who said that's a real challenge for any red-blooded chemist. He worked for years, and he kept looking at, at um, not pyrimidyl aldehydes, but he was putting the, he didn't think about dimers. He was thinking about trying to chelate nitrogen one point closer uh, uh, to, the, to the aldehyde. But um, yeah, it's, it's a very, um, very uh, constrained and precise reaction and possibly meaningless for origin of life. <laughs> Great, thank you. All right, we have one on. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, it, I got the idea that it's really important to amplify certain reaction. What about the reaction that are inhibited? Uh, does those byproducts just waste of the body, waste yeah. of the reaction, or they lead to any severe biologically cause at so, the end? Yeah, good question. Yeah, it's it's um, both of those things can help you get. Um, a higher EE. Kinetic resolutions you could call a, an inhibition, right? Because you make one go faster than the other and you inhibit essentially the other. You could talk about the, the uh, eutectic partitioning. You know, we, we crash out a lot of the minor and antimer. You basically, if you were looking at, prebiotic world didn't care about yield you know, so much, but, um, but you know, you end up with high E in solution, but at the cost of most of the, you know, almost half your product if, if you're close to racemic. Um, so inhibition, Inhibition is also a good amplification mechanism, <laughs> um, but um, and in fact, we're, like I said, we're finding out that most of the most of the things that, that we can get high EEs in prebiotic chemistry has to do with kinetic resolutions. So it's just trying to make one reaction take off while we the other hand we pull back. All right, I think we are just at the. Time to stop. This was an incredible talk, Donna. Thank you so much. Uh, we really love this and we learned a huge amount. Thank so you thank you for giving thank our HODL lecture. <laughs> thank you.